Well, this is a theme I could take much more broadly, as indeed some people did earlier this morning. But for the sake of time and simplicity, I'm going to concentrate on one side, which is Tirifor, and particularly dependent on the good works of Gordon Cook, whose chronology has contributed to piecing this apart, if that's the right way to put it. For those of you who need to have pointed out where this island of Lismore is, it is just here, strategically in this entry point into the heart of Scotland, the heart of real Scotland up here. Um, and <laughs> I'm always controversial. And we've taken a, a landscape approach. So when I, again, I say that when I'm concentrating on Tira 4, there is a broader landscape into which to situate this particular site. But in a sense, it illustrates at a much smaller scale than some of the examples we had this morning, how even a small site can govern memory in various different ways. And this is perhaps the best um, views of any site are found in the local post office. And this is the one that I collect from a postcard. And you can see the way in which Lismore moves towards Mull. There is the famous lighthouse at the end, where the, the ferry goes up towards or Iona around the corner. So this is, shows how it's very strategically situated. And indeed, there is a, a memory scape that goes towards Ben Nevis and beyond, um, if we were to take a landscape approach. And indeed, just pointing out the approximate location of Tira 4, it, is a, it has a view over the local estuary that is very local. So this is its um, seascape. And another thing that we want to do is we take this towards publication, which will take place during my sabbatical next year, and just anticipating the question possibly someone in the audience. Um, I want to situate this sense of... Um, landscape within the, the different memories that um, it has encountered or people encountered. Just for those who don't know this project, it was a project that started back in the year 2000. Indeed, I think I even launched it in Glasgow at a similar conference to this one here. And although it has a Cambridge component, it goes much wider than that, as you will see at the end. I'm very grateful to a large number of people who have contributed towards it. And Cambridge used to have a plane an aeroplane, that is, but this has now been sold, and like many there are cuts everywhere. And what, before that plane was sold, we flew over the island, and benefiting from Digimap and Canmore, two wonderful services, we did do a desktop assessment, which teased out some of the elements, such as that estuarine, that maritime outlook of Tira 4 that I referred to before, and we also surveyed the monument. Then we paused a little bit, and we put in two fairly intensive but short years of field work, concentrating on Terra 4, looking at a few other sites, and also with the aid of English Heritage, someone who's been moved to administration now, um, another sign of the times, he um, did some very useful work setting Terra 4 into its wider area. And finally, um, picking up a theme that we've heard in the last few talks, um, we did a community project, working very much with the local islanders, they raised the money, um, we raised the money from Historic Scotland, with the aid of Historic Scotland, put it together, and we left the site that we excavated with a more consolidated memory than the one we found it in, if you see what I mean. In other words, it's, it's more, um, it's a safe for the future as well. Now, the, the theme of my title, Garden of Time, is taken from Richard Bradley, one of his many works on, on time, one of his many contributions to the archaeology of Scotland. And here are two examples which are very deliberate. Um, one is Tara, where you have a monument that builds up over time. And in a micro scale, this is what you see at Tira 4 as well. It's a much smaller scale, but it's, it's there, getting larger, having parts added to it, and then becoming part of a memory. It's seen in maps and then in the perceptions of the islanders today. So that is the case of Tara. I've also discovered this in Malta, where I spend quite a lot of my archaeological time too. And then on the right here, this is not a brock. This is Sardinia, and I think, indeed, I will point to the end, I'm going to do some flagrant self-publicity next year in September after another conference this September on a similar island theme. I want to bring together the Scottish and the Sardinians in a, a concentrated study of monuments through time, taking those as two focal points, but looking at the histories of monuments, inviting people from both locations, but I must push ahead with what I really should be talking about, which is the site of Tira 4. 
And the, the sort of scheme that I'm putting together, I've done this for Malta and for uh, the Irish um, sequence as well. It's a little, it needs a lot of infilling here. These are preliminary steps, as I say, that I will build up over the peer course of time as we look in detail at other elements that we can fit together. But first, a first key thing is when do people first arrive? I know this date is constantly being revised, so we'll skate over that quickly. The, the next um, major feature in the landscape is the central placing of funerary monuments. And then, these are, this is the innovative part of this lecture, is that we now have dating of the, the phasing of Tyrifil Brock. We never actually excavated within the Brock, but we have a good sense of when human occupation was um, first organized. We were able to excavate outside, and then we have the construction of an adjunct building interfingered with the arrival of a, a different relationship to the, the mainland, the construction of an external bank noticeably after the, uh, the death of St. Mark And then, very interestingly, there are a lot of indications of how that site was, was employed by, um, um, as a roosting zone for animals. In other words, it became abandoned, but then it comes back into focus as a cartographic landmark. And then it's part of the vision of the landowners today, but in a diminished way. There are other things, as you'll see later, that are more important to them in terms of creating an identity of the island. So here was our initial survey, um, and we excavated out in the, this front area here. We did the survey of this, and then we repaired the damage um, to these three locations with consolidation as a final phase in 2008. And what I'm really going to be talking about is the implications of the dating that we've been able to put together. This is an unfazed stratigraphy. In other words, I haven't adjusted for the fact that the dates are where they are. Here someone's wondering why there are dates that are not quite in, in, in a chronological order. But what is very nice is that so far with these few dates, everything is in stratigraphic order. So I think what we would need to do is feeding a few more dates with some, these all done on animal bones. And that's one of the great strengths of this particular island, that it is a limestone island, therefore the availability of environmental information is extremely good, unlike its, its neighboring mainland, which of course has more acidic soils. So although the numbers of bones here are not enormous, they are, I think, quite a major contribution to our knowledge. So what I'm going to do is just feed this information into um, an understanding of different parts of the site. And I thought I'd, that sponsorship is a key of all archaeology through some sort of indirect linkage. And we have some haggis support into this particular picture. This is a, um, a private plane that I went up with, with, um, with an English heritage inspector, in fact. And we took some very important photos of the excavation progress. So this is the, the main block itself. We excavated with, into the entrance and also the forecourt. And it's this that is sort of adding the layers of memory to this very major monument that is a landmark from the sea, as I've already pointed out. The first memory is very insubstantial. I sort of, in, in Malta I could offer you more Neolithic, but here I, I mean, I'm shameful to produce this in the light of the first few lectures this morning, but um, Neolithic, Bronze Age, whatever, but this is the obviously unstratified within the site itself. What is quite interesting in terms of the development of Argyle, and Argyle is relatively unknown chronologically, as I understand it, in terms of, of um, the dating of uh, monumental structures of the, the Iron Age, is that out here in this deposit, in this um, build-up in front of the terrace, we have the earliest date, a build-up of midden deposit that forms the working surface where there was also at a later stage metal working and a certain amount of pottery and other types of activity. Um, in front of the Brock itself. We are actually standing on the Brock. We do have a, a sort of photographic tower, but not quite as effective as some of the medieval examples we've seen earlier. And in this particular um, area, we do have the, the, the minimum numbers are not, this is all done on number of identified fragments, but even so, and there are many more unidentified fragments, as with a fragmented assemblage. But um, but even though the numbers of, and I'll show you the totals later, in the order of sort of three or four thousand for the whole site, um, identified fragments, even so, we can begin to get some sort of picture of the, the type of subsistence that was employed at this early stage. And what is quite interesting is that in early stage, there's a little bit more wild, I think it would be fair to say. There is a survival of deer being exploited on the island. And in terms of the predation, presumably by, probably by owls, but not in great 
great quantity at this stage, it looks as though because of human occupation there's a lesser presence of, um, of owls on the site. Um, it's, it's quite a simple vole predation um, on this particular location. And then the flora, you can see here, it's mainly um, um, barley and oats that are the, the key. Then we move into the adjunct building. You can see you begin to have a build-up of from one basic structure, perhaps, it, and this is the, the, the soil underneath this structure, and then this structure is put in place. This helps date the actual walling of the structure, which lies in front of the, um, the monument. And as we move into the entrance, we find that there's um, early occupation still surviving, but then the rubble infill goes right up to 1600 AD. And it's indeed in this location that you find quite a lot of evidence of owl predation. So this, in this later abandonment phase, this is being, monument is being used as a roost for, for owls. And there's some quite nice um, detail here of the paving as you move into the monument. And also even the, um, the doorway, um, I suppose, um, points where the, the, the door would have hinged on, in, and also some of the construction that underlay the foundations of the monument itself. So one of the constructional details we've been able to unravel is precisely this, the way in which the monument is bedded into this quite fissured limestone eroded landscape. In order to level it up, they employed this dry stone walling in order to level the ground to provide a, a secure foundation, and then put in these entrance features um, in order to allow a secure defence, or at least a symbolic edge to the site itself. Just close to the entrance is just to the right here. One of the more exciting finds that we found in terms of material culture was a, and this is dated both by radiocarbon and by this um, brooch, um, Roman brooch, was at about this level here, we in deposits in the entrance court, we found um, evidence what, what looks like to be a deliberate um, placing of this brooch. Um, and then in the upper levels, the infill goes up to 700 AD. So there's a long use of this site that goes well beyond the traditional dated period of rocks. And this is something that happens with monuments in many, many cases, of course. But here, we, in the course of the, the study of this, we'll tease out these, these details. And we can look at a little bit here at the, the way in which um, the... Um, the fauna develops. And you can see by this stage, the red deer and the road deer are just decreasing slightly um, in, in quantity. Um, so, so there seems to be a decline in the wild um, employment. And you can also look at in slightly increased, rather increased diversity in terms of the take. Perhaps the owls are already at this stage intermittently being able to roost within this particular site. So we, we hope to be able to show the, the level of human impact on the site by looking at sensitive predators such as the owls themselves as they occupy the monument according to the stratigraphic stages. Another interesting feature of this is that the history of the monument is not ended because at that same 700 AD this actual bank is put into place and here is a detail of some of the construction of the outer bank in front of the monument itself. So the monument is continuing to amplify through time um, its history, its memory, its construction memory is not ended. A little bit above this, in the turf, in fact, I should really have said in the turf rather than just unstratified, but unstratified in terms of chronological information, is this very, another distinctive um, um, piece of material culture which Ewan Campbell, the arbiter of all these things, uh, has um, said that it's probably 8th century in date with a sort of very distinctive sort of ram's head and mushroom, a ram feature on a mushroom head is how he describes it in the, in the report. So some frequentation of the site, a little bit later perhaps, even the construction of that bank itself. And we can again look at the form, I won't go into this detail, the same sort of indication that owls were relatively undisturbed by perhaps this stage, and the same decrease, I think it's fair to say, in the, the wild, perhaps a little bit more up in that part of the diagram. And we can also compare that with the, the abandonment fauna. Uh, you have to be, we have to be very careful with some of these interpretations, of course, because residuality may take over with some of these deposits in terms of material being recovered from um, zones lower down in the stratigraphy. 
passing, so that is the, the phasing of the, the site in, in its brief details in the time that I have available. I just, here are some just generalities. Here are the number of um, identified um, specimens. So we're not dealing with a large sample, but perhaps for, um, for, for some excavations of rocks, uh, it, it's reasonably large. Um, David Orson has done a detailed study of the taphonomy of this and the processing, and it is a very much a heavily processed deposit. So it's part of the, the working um, through of these animals to the, to the maximum on this particular site. Very slightly degraded, but once degraded by human action, well preserved by natural action is probably the way to put it. One thing that is quite interesting, as I've already pointed out, is the presence of um, wild fauna, including intriguingly a bear, a bear phalange, which may well have come in on a pelt. So this may well have been something quite exotic that um, and it is from a securely dated part of the site, so you can imagine that small things indicate something of reasonable prestige, and quite a lot of animals. Some of these placed in significant parts of the site. Um, there's also, I think we slipped past it, but there's also a human cranial fragment placed in the bank at a significant location, not in the Iron Age levels, but in the later levels, as we now know from the, the dating. Another thing that um, is, I think, coming through from the site, this is uh, passing again to generalities, and um, Mayan White has been looking at the owl occupation, and this, as I pointed out, helps us articulate not just the presence of dated material, but also how present were humans at a particular moment in time, because, of course, some predators will not tolerate human presence. And it, it does seem that in the upper bank and in the entrance fill, there is a greater presence of um, owl discard, if I can put it this way, than in other zones. And she, Rhiannon, has shown that it looks like a tawny owl, very probably, because of the similarity um, in terms of distribution of different body parts to predations that she's looked at in the wild. She's worked at Chateau Hewitt, a site that was um, mentioned earlier, and other places. And by comparison, she uh, was able to establish this. That said, very well preserved, again, because of the... Um, the limestone conditions of the site. Uh, something that is very minuscule, unfortunately, is the presence of fish. We are in a maritime location, um, and, all, and this sampling is, um, comes from floral sampling, you know, sampling sediments, as well as hand-picked samples. So it, it should be fairly representative, but we do read across the top here, for those who can't see it, herring, cod, um, pollock, um, etc. There is a range of fish, but not in a, enormous uh, quantities. And indeed, in the isotopic information, it does look as though, I apologize not to have the axes here, it didn't transfer very well in my putting this together, but this is the nitrogen axis and this is the carbon isotope axis. And it does look, according to um, the, the um, Tamsin O'Connell, who's done this for us at Cambridge, it looks to be a terrestrial system. Therefore, this is not a fishing village. I mean, this is perhaps self-evident for those who are experts on the Iron Age. This is a terrestrially based system that we seem to be dealing with. Seemingly, for not, and what is interesting is she's, um, um, that these are animals, but we've also seen it for the, um, the, hu the, hum the human as well. So it looks as though this is the way in which um, this is organized. Um, finally, um, in terms of the generalities, I think, um, Chris Hunt at um, Queen's Belfast has looked at the mollusks, and this seems to show the two features. One is that it's still fairly well vegetated, even during major periods of human occupation. But also, there are lots of um, um, mollusks there which enjoy the sort of midden-like quality of um, this particular site. He also discovered the same phenomenon in Malta, where they enjoyed the midden-like quality of the mortuary remains that we are uncovering. But here, it's a different sort of diet that we, we encounter, which doesn't seem to be primarily human. Um, sorry, I forgot about the, the, the carbonized cereals. This is the, the general light. This is, in fact, Gard, um, Jenny Miller um, from Gard. Um, or Gard as was, if I can put it that way. Northern Lights, I think, is the, the word we use now. And here we, we can see the main range of materials. Wheat hardly present, but the main um, features are oat and barley in this particular site collectively. And this is just her comment on that. If we take this forward into the memory scape, this is something that is some, something that I wish to build on and develop. Um, coming back to um, coming to Edinburgh to really look at the archives, going to the islands themselves and talking to them, and also going to Kilmartin to look at the local records. But you can see that um, Lismore begins to appear in this landscape, 
but on the, the chart it's actually appeared by 1860, but also very early with Laud's map 1654, you've got the Tirafor being mentioned, because it is a landmark, it is a very important feature of this landscape. As you approach from the ferry, as I'm sure many of you have, you will see it reaching up above you. It is unmistakable as something of human-made importance. And this is it's a little bit disappointing to us um, to find that it's not quite so prominent in the imagination of the current Lismore Islanders. And in fact, you can see here, this was a study done by Mary Kate Garden of Glasgow Caledonian University with Matthew Fitzjohn of Liverpool University. And you can see these are the, the sort of the photo recognition, the various techniques, standard techniques for looking at perception in landscapes. And you can see that the community hall is much more important. And indeed, I've given several lectures there. I can see the, the way in which it focuses the attention of the local people. The church is quite clearly important. And interesting mobile resources like sheep and cattle are very important. But here is the brock. It is just beaten by the lighthouse and by, um, and even the, um, the signal station, well, the croft is uh, important. It's, it's at that sort of level in the, within the cultural heritage. One thing that I'd just like to end on is that, as I mentioned at the very beginning, we did a, a detailed study with colleagues from the University of York and a number of others of the, um, the, the damage to the monument before consolidation and then of the work that Colin Rowan, a local um, stonemason, um, did in reconstructing it. So this is the major damage that um, has occurred here. There's enormous rockfall. So very carefully we, we looked at it, um, recorded it, and then with using simple photogrammetry, um, recorded it again once it had been put back in place. And this is recorded here in, in the, a potential poster, which I don't think has yet to be mounted, but it shows the situation before consolidation. The key aspect of informed research in any conservation, I think this is something that politicians need to know. You don't just do it with a little bit of plaster, you need to actually prepare the ground and then a good record of what you've done, so that when you have these excavations, which some people recorded on by the Ministry of Works or whatever, um, it will not be the case again that you won't know which is modern and which is, um, which is ancient. And one very important thing that is consolidating that memory um, is the islanders' construction of their, their own museum, and so this rock now forms part of a, a trail through the landscape, and therefore, in the same way as other people recorded, we can consolidate the importance of that memory so that people treat this monument effectively in the future and um, treasure it, value it, for the, not just for the past, but for its future importance. One little bit of um, publicity. I am organizing a conference which is little relevant to this conference um, in September of this year on the theme of the Iron Age, which is about identity. But what I want to draw your attention to is what I started by saying is that I'd like to invite particularly those interested in the Iron Age in the audience to a conference in Cambridge in September 2012 where it seems a, a little artificial perhaps, but not, I think, because here are two types of monuments which are permanent features in the landscape and which have produced history, they've constructed history in this way, and I'd like to bring people together with that particular theme to, to celebrate the importance of these landmarks in our landscapes, be they in southern or northern Europe. And the final thing I'd just like to draw attention to is the support of, of very many different bodies um, which have made this possible, and particularly the number of different, it's not just the University of Cambridge as I've said, but a whole series of people. So people migrate, of course, so they're, they're not always in the same locations where they started, but I'm really indebted to them. i also like to show you a, a very happy moment. Uh, and also a rather less happy moment. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>